welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Deborah Cobray. I want to do just a little bit of instruction tonight and teach out of the Word of God about communion, and then we're going to receive communion tonight. So if you've got your Bibles, I want you to go with me. We're going to be looking in Hebrews, and then we'll be in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. But Jim was this morning, and I want to play off of this morning. Is that all right? And so this morning, Jim was in Hebrews, the third chapter, and Pastor Dan was last week, and my husband was this week. And we were looking at, I better get there, we were looking at Hebrews chapter 3, and he's been in chapter 3 for a couple of weeks. And in verse 12, there's a warning. It says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, well, it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ. If, and here's the condition, if is a very big word. So there's a condition here about being a partaker. There's a warning, as you know, and then there's a big if. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. And so Jim was preaching this morning, and he said there's five things that he gave us for a daily discipline that we need to do, exhort one another daily. That word exhort means to encourage and to, and to warn and to speak and to build. It, it has the root of courage in it, to lift up and to edify, to build up each other. And that was his first point is encourage each other. Encourage yourself and others in the Lord, point one. This is stuff that we're to do every day. And then point two, he said that we are to get God's life every day. And he took us to Deuteronomy, and we found out that how do I do that? Well, the life of the flesh, the life of God, is in the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning. And John tells us that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And he was using Hebrews, and he's in that portion of Hebrews, and Hebrews in that third chapter speaking of Israel. They were in the wilderness, and that God fed them manna. Now, I want you to go with me to John chapter 6, because Jim used the, the illustration of manna this morning, that how do we get life every day? Well, just as God fed them manna in the wilderness, the word manna actually in the Hebrew means what is it? We find in the Psalms that it was angel food. It had never been seen on earth before. We found out that you could only collect it one day at a time, and God gave them Friday, they could collect enough for Saturday, and when they did collect it, it would actually multiply for the Sabbath. It was miraculous. They lived on it and were sustained on it for 40 years. Every day they went out and collected it. Every day they ate it, and every day after a while they started complaining about eating the same thing over and over. But it was manna. And in Deuteronomy, Jim read the verse, and I'll just quote it to you. In Deuteronomy chapter 3, God said, I tested you 40 years in the wilderness, and I fed you manna, so that you would know that man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, the warning in Hebrews is we are partakers of Christ if we hold fast our confidence, the confidence that we had at the beginning, it says, to the end. Now, when you and I got saved, we were very, very excited about the Lord. How many can remember their new birth. Do you remember? I carried my Bible everywhere. Everywhere I carried it. And that was back in the early 70s when I got saved. And I was radical. And God says, if you hold fast your confidence, the confidence, the hope, the faith that you had at the very beginning of your walk with Jesus Christ to the end, Now, I'm talking about the five things he said, and then I'm going to mix it with communion tonight. Because he said, point number two, got to get the life of God every day. And the life of God every day is the word of God. So he said, to get the life of God every day, it's the living word of God. And Jesus said in John chapter 6, and I want you to look with me in verse 47. Jesus said, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. 
Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Now, what has that got to do with communion tonight? Well, let's just go back to the warning in Hebrews. Beware. Exhort one another daily. And the five things that Jim gave us, Pastor Jim gave us this morning. Number one. Encourage each other in the Lord. Number two, get the life of God every day. The life of God is the word of God. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And he uses manna as the example. He says, I'm the manna that came down. In other words, the bread of life, the living life that God was training Israel to understand. They came out of Egypt. They had a slave mentality. They knew nothing but the idols of Egypt and the stories of old, right? So here they come out of Egypt, and God tests them in the wilderness. So they ended up in the wilderness 40 years because they refused to go into the promised land, and so they had to go back into the wilderness, And it's in that wilderness that they are fed 40 years every day by manna, angel's food, God's bread. And Jesus then refers to it in John chapter 6 and says, I am the bread of life. He who believes in me has everlasting life. God is saying that the bread of life, the living manna, the life of God that we can get every day is found in Jesus Christ and it's appropriated by faith. Because Jesus said, go back with me to John chapter 6. Most assuredly, I say to you, verse 47, he who believes in me has everlasting life. He who what? He who what? He who what? It's beliefs. Jesus didn't say those who work hard, those who obey all the rules, those who can take the law and live by the law under that regime. He said, he who believes in me shall have everlasting life. Now that word everlasting is forever and ever. And the word life there is Zoe. It's the God kind of life. It's life that exists in and by itself. It's God's life. God is life. Jesus is life. So everlasting life doesn't happen when we die and we get to eternity. Everlasting life happens now. It begins now. When you said yes to Jesus Christ, when you said, I believe in your faith, your heart heard it and believed it, and you begin to appropriate that which Jesus has done for you on that cross, you are partaking of eternal life, and you're partaking of the bread of life. And as you read the Word of God, as I read the Word of God, as I begin to devour this book, as I begin to let the Spirit of the living God teach me in this book, as I begin to see that this isn't a history lesson, but this is a manual for living, and in here, every jot, every tittle, the word of God is not void of his power, that when God speaks it, it is so, and as I believe it, and as I decree it, and as I live it out in my own life, I am partaking of this amazing Zoe life, the God kind of life that God wants you and I to have. Now, Jim said that we've got to get life every day. Then he said, point number three, I wrote these down. He said, then you're going to have to rehearse. Rehearse what, who you are in Christ and who he is in you. Now, you can't rehearse something if you don't know it. you got to have it, right? If I'm an actor and I've got a lines and I've got a, a stage play, I'm going to have to rehearse those lines so I remember them, right? So this means that I have to do this over and over and over again. That I can't just hear the Word of God one time about one subject, but i got to hear it over and over and over and over. And I'm 62 this year. I married Jim when I was 28. Took me to a Word of Faith convention on our honeymoon. I heard for the first time some teachings about how faith works And here I am, 33 plus years later, and I still have to hear it 
over and over and over again because guess what? Every decade of my life, every year of my life, there are new experiences that I have to have faith for. I never stop growing. I never stop learning. I never stop changing. So he said to rehearse God. And then he said that we got to pray. And then he said that we have to prepare for trouble so that it doesn't take us out because we're in a war. So tonight I want to add one more thing to that list. And I want to add, and this doesn't have to be a daily discipline, but this is a discipline of the church. I want to add the communion, the Lord's Supper to this. Because something happens when we take communion. It isn't just remembering. It's not just a sacrament of the church. It's not something that we do because it's a religious thing to do. He has commanded us to do this for a reason. And I wanted this to be a part of that list, although Jim's lists are daily, and you can take communion daily in your home. I want to take you back to the early church in the first century, and I want to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, because that's where we really see a picture of what was happening with the early church. Now, I said tonight was family night, and it is family night. We don't have a lot of special things going on. We have gathered the church together, and we're just a family here. And if we could go back uh, 2,000 years and just take a peek at the inside of what it was like to be in the early church, this is what you'd see. You'd see house churches. They gathered in homes. They gathered in Corinth in homes. They also gathered in the synagogues. This was a Greek church, a Gentile church, but they gathered in small groups. And then they would come together and they would have what they called love feasts. You'll find this in Acts, the second chapter, Acts, the 20th chapter. You can see this history all the way through. They didn't have priests. They didn't have sacraments. They didn't have formalized religion. All they had was the letters from Paul, letters from John, letters from James. They had the letters in the Old Testament, and some of them didn't have all of them. They just had bits and pieces. So as they would come together, they would actually bring their food, and they would have a potluck. So that's why tonight, if this was family night, really, if we were all in a house and we all gathered together, there's about 500 of us in here, however many there are, we'd have to have a pretty big house, but we'd all bring something. And we'd be eating dinner together. And so Paul, and he's, he's writing to Corinth, the church of Corinth, and he's actually answering questions and he's correcting. And this is what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So go there with me, and then we'll get into communion. I'm going to read this in the New Living Testament. It's not on the overhead. I'm just going to read it out loud, so just listen. He's correcting. He says, first of all, there's factions and divisions among them, and he understands that. He's just told them about women wearing the veil because the women were actually in rebellion. They decided they were so free they didn't have to have a veil on. But it was the custom to wear the veil, and he said, hey, get your veils back on. Don't be rebellious. And then he, he talks about factions and divisions, and then he addresses the love feast or the dinners. And he says in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty, 20, he says, when you meet together, you're not really interested in the Lord's Supper. For some of you hurry to eat your own meal without sharing with others. As a result, some go hungry while others are getting drunk. Oh, my, getting drunk. Yeah, getting drunk. Okay, so does that sound like... Our family at the rock? Well, could be, yeah. Look, God's not religious. He takes a community of people from all kinds of backgrounds and gathers them together. They hear the word of God. Faith comes in the heart. You say yes to Jesus. Those who believe in me shall have everlasting life. And then he brings us together as this amazing community and family and body. And guess what? There's a lot of junk to work out of us. These people were bringing their potluck and their meals, and some of them were drunk. Now, if you're drunk tonight, you can take heart. What, he says, 
Don't you have your own homes for eating and drinking? Or do you really want to disgrace God's church and shame the poor? What am I supposed to say? Do you want me to praise you? Well, I certainly will not praise you for this. Now, that's the New Living Testament. If you've got your Bibles, let's read it in the New King James. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Now, he's indignant. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in, or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. Verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Verse 26. And I think we have it. I don't know if you've got it up on the overhead or not. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I want to stop there. And I just want to go back now. Here we are, first century church. They're having a potluck. They're bringing their own food. The poor that don't have any food aren't getting anybody else's. These people are just eating their own food. They're drinking and they're getting drunk. And then they decide to have the Lord's Supper. They're breaking bread together and they're going to have the Lord's Supper. And Paul says, you are wrong. You're doing this wrong. Now, God, Jesus Christ, he said, deliver this to me. And he gives instructions on what they're to do. And he says, as long as you... Do this, take the bread and drink the cup and remember me. You proclaim, you proclaim, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So we see that there's something going on here. He says, this isn't just a meal. This is more than what you know, and there's more going on. He corrects their attitude, and he corrects their behavior. Now, I don't know about you, but that makes me feel good about this church. I've often asked Jim, if Jesus was going to write us a letter, because I've read the seven letters to the seven churches of the book of Revelation, and there's only two letters that aren't scathing. The other five are all corrective and scathing and frightening. Have you read them? If you haven't, do read them. If, if the Lord were to send us a letter... What would he say about this church, and what would he say about our leadership? So when I hear about the Corinth church getting drunk, running over the poor, and not understanding what's going on, I don't feel so bad when I hear what's going on with some of our family members and what some of the rascals in this little church are doing. Because I know that we are being gathered from the north, the south, the east, and the west, and God is changing us and cleaning us up. And that there's more going on than you know or I know. And that this thing is so real that he is the living manna from heaven. He's the bread of life. And as we're to take life every day, he says, now I want you to take my supper. And when you do, you remember me. When you take the bread, remember me. When you drink the wine, remember me. For when you remember me, you proclaim my death until I return. There is past, there is present, and there is future. What is he saying? He's saying, you proclaim my death until I return. First, he says, remember me in the Lord's Supper. That means we go back. We look back. We remember what he's done. We remember that the past, that there was an amazing event that happened to change our lives and our eternity. When you take communion tonight, there is a past in this. That there was identification from God, that God became man. And then the man, God, the last Adam, substituted for us. There was identification. And then he substituted, and he became the lamb. The man became the lamb. And then the lamb became the sacrifice. And then the sacrifice substituted for you and I so that I didn't have to face the penalty of death and sin, but Jesus took it for me. And not only do I remember what he's done, but now I can partake I can be a partaker, like it said in Hebrews. For we are partakers of Christ if we hold fast 
our beginning hope until the end, our beginning confession. When you take communion, you remember. When you take communion, spiritually, something is happening on the inside of us. When I take communion, I am remembering what he's done, that God became the man, that the man became the substitute, and the substitute took on the penalty for my sin. Not only did he substitute for me, but now I can partake of his resurrection power and the benefits and the privileges and the blessings that now happen with me. So I don't know about you, but I need to remember that. And he says, and you proclaim my death until I return. So we looked at past, the present, is it, listen, when I'm taking communion and Pastor Dan's going to come up in just a minute with me, not only do we remember, but now we can, in the present, appropriate the blessing of what Jesus has done in this resurrection life that he's given us as the bread of life. He said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood. Now, those are hard verses, and he is not talking about literally eating his flesh and drinking his blood. He is talking about when you believe in him, that the sacrifice on Calvary came, that he died. He went to hell. He took the keys of death and hell from Satan. He ascended to the Father. He put his blood on the mercy seat. That blood was accepted, and that all sin was washed away from those who believe. Who believe. Who believe, who believe, who believe. He substituted our sickness for his divine life, and there's healing in the blood. He substituted my poverty for his wealth so that there is prosperity in the kingdom of God. He exchanged my sin for his righteousness so that now I can be right before God and I can do right before God. He sanctified me and set me apart. That is the present, that is the future. That is everything that we have in Christ Jesus. And he says, you proclaim my death until I return. So the future is his coming. And I don't know if a lot of us really look for his coming or not. But you know, that's something we're supposed to do, church. This is a family night. So I'm just talking to you out of my heart as mom, okay? This isn't a preaching sermon. This is just me talking to you about what it says. You proclaim my death until it until he comes. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. What does that mean? Do you have Matthew chapter 26, verse 29? Can I have that up there? But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Future. The early church was looking for his coming every day. Every day. When you take communion, and I take communion. I am proclaiming his death until he returns. I'm looking forward. That's where they said, Maranatha, Lord, come quickly. They were believing for him to return. We are closer to his return than we've ever been, church. And I think a church that has a shout is a church that is waiting for him to return. Is a church that has their heart guarded that my king could come at any time. That this could be it. And I am going to live my life not for myself. I'm not going to get drunk. I'm not going to be, be selfish. But I'm going to change my life because he's coming. And they believed it. Now, church, do we believe he's coming? Because when we take communion, we are proclaiming his death until he returns. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Past, present, and future. He is the living bread. He is the manna. He is the bread of life. And we appropriate this and we receive this by nothing more than faith. You don't do it by works. You do it by faith. Now, this is my last thing, and then we're going to take communion. How do I take communion? Now, this is where we go at the rock every time we have communion. And he says to the church, now remember, they were rascals. He's correcting them. He says in verse 27, therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. What has he just been talking about? How about the love feasts? How about the factions? How about the divisions? How about the rebellion? Read chapter 11. This is all in context. He's talking to the church. He says, 
If you eat this in an unworthy manner, you will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and let a woman examine herself. So let them eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself or herself. Not discerning the Lord's body. Not just his body, but the church. We are his body. They were together doing this. They were not paying attention to the poor. They were having factions and divisions. They didn't realize that what they did to each other represented what they did to him. There's more going on here than just having a sacrament, having something religious happen on a Sunday night. We're proclaiming and we are remembering. He says, for this reason, many are weak and sick among you and many sleep. You're dying. But when we are, but if we would judge ourselves, verse 31, we would not be judged. But when we judge, we, but, but, but when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together, wait for one another. But if anyone's hungry, let him eat at home. Stop this madness. Lest you come together for judgment, and the rest I will settle in order when I come. Now look, he's talking to the church. How do I take communion? I take it in a worthy manner. Communion represents my past, my present, and my future. I'm to take communion and remember and I am to proclaim as an act, as I take communion, there is a proclamation and a declaration going forth from my life as I receive this holy cup and this holy bread. So how am I to take it? I'm to take it in a worthy manner. What does that mean? It means, number one, do not take communion if you are not born again. Because it's an unworthy thing for you to do that. And we're going to give you an opportunity tonight, if you are not right with God, to receive Jesus Christ, and then you come on into the family and receive communion instantly. And the second thing is to judge ourselves and examine our hearts. If you have something in your life that's glaring at you right now, that's bugging you right now, that God's speaking to you about, let's deal with it tonight before you take communion. Because God wants us cleansed and washed so that we can remember and we can proclaim so that we can just not only remember what he's done, but appropriate in the present in my everyday life the benefits and the privileges of being partakers of his kingdom. Healing, I believe, is in the cup. Healing is in the bread of communion. I believe miracles are in that communion cup and bread. I believe that God has amazing things for his people as they hear and as they believe, and as they do. But we have to do it in a worthy manner. Now look, I'm not asking you to have sin consciousness tonight, and every wrong word you said, I'm not worthy to take it. Of course you're not worthy. Nobody's worthy, but by the blood we're worthy. But if there's something you need to get rid of tonight before we have it, I want you to do it. Are you with me? So, if you're not right with God, if you're not born again, I want to give you an opportunity tonight to receive Jesus Christ. I don't want you to partake of this in an unworthy way. God brought you here tonight so that you could hear this gospel message and so that you could change your life. These were people in the church. But some of them were dying because they weren't serving God and they were just playing church. And in America, we can play church. We can go to church. We can carry our Bibles. we become a religious system. And in the American church, I can't speak for other churches. I can only speak for the American church because I've been in a lot of them. I can say that I grew up in a culture of religion. I grew up in a culture that says if you go to this, if you go to that, if you confess your sins, if you do this, you're going to be okay. But God doesn't say that. God says you must be born again. And are you born again? Have you said yes to Jesus Christ? Do you know that he died for you? That he laid his life on that cross for you and for I? 
Jesus said, if you look at that cross and you believe, he said, I am the bread of life. If you believe in me, you'll have everlasting life. If you believe that I am who I said I am, that I've died on that cross for you, and by believing that I am God, that I am all man, and that I came, identified with mankind, substituted my life for yours, died on that cross, and took your sin. If you believe that, he says then, if you confess with your mouth and believe it in your heart, you'll be saved. It's as simple as that. All over this auditorium right now, if you're not right with God, I'm talking to you. If you need to get saved tonight, you're here for that reason. I got saved years ago out of a drug culture, as bad as anybody could be, and yet God loved me so much. He brought me and saved me and cleansed me. But I had to receive his salvation. He couldn't give it to me without me receiving it. It's like communion. You've got to take it. You've got to believe it. So if you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm talking to you. If you've never said yes to Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, not what you have in your head, but what you've done with your heart. If you've never committed all of your life to him, if you've never surrendered to him, I'm talking to you. If you've been a good person, been in church, but you've never given your life to him, I'm, I'm talking to you. I just want you, I'm going to count to three, I just want you to lift your hand. We're just going to pray with you right now and get you right with God before we take communion. So are you ready? One, two, three. Lift your hands if you need to get right with God. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand over there. I see that hand. I see that hand. Yeah, there's people in here that need to say yes to Jesus. I'm surrendering my life to you, Lord. I want you to be Lord and Savior of my life. If you've not done that, there I see hands all over. I see that hand. I see that hand. Yes. Yes. Now, this is what we're going to do. We're going we're gonna to pray with you. I'm not going to have you come forward. I'm just going to pray with you. I want st Let's just stand up because then we're going to do something else. Now, if you raised your hand, you pray this from your heart. I saw about 20 hands go up. You pray this from your heart. God hears your heart. He listens, and we're going to pray this with you. You are surrendering your heart and your life to Jesus Christ. Here's what's happening. Jesus Christ said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And Nicodemus said, how do I do that? And he said, I'm going to a cross, Nicodemus. When you look at that cross and you believe, Nicodemus, that as I am lifted up, I'm going to draw men to me. If you believe and surrender your life to me, Nicodemus, you'll be born again. So that's what we're going to do right now as we pray this prayer. So repeat after me. Father, I come to you. In Jesus' name. And I believe that you are God, that you are the Savior of the world, and that in you is everlasting life. Father, I ask that you forgive me of my sins. I ask that you cleanse me. That you fill me with your spirit and help me to become the child of God, you want me to be for the rest of my days on this earth. Thank you, Father. I can now say, Jesus Christ is my Savior, and he's my Lord. Now, I want you to just tell somebody next to you. I just prayed that prayer. Just tell somebody, and if you're already a believer, just tell somebody I'm a believer, and I prayed it again, and I love Jesus. Dan, can you come up? You know, there's always, Elijah, I need you at the piano. Let's get into the presence of God and the Spirit of God here. You know, there's always a, there's always a tension and a line in the kingdom of God, always, between mercy, judgment, how far, how far does that line go? You know, what is sin to one person isn't to another. Here's the bottom line, guys. He loves us. This is not a religion of law. This is a relationship with the living God who proved his love to us and introduced us to this agape love when we were sinners and enemies of his. And if he loved me when I was out tearing pages of my Bible that my mother put in my 
VW van back in the 70s as I'm selling hash in Europe. Tearing out Bible pages because I ran out of paper, winding up a joint. He loved me then. He loves me now, but he loved me as much then as he loves me now. He loved me then. It's that crazy 20-something young woman that was just out of her mind. I'm talking about a relationship. He doesn't want me to obey him because I'm afraid of him and it's fire insurance and I want to make heaven. He wants me to obey him as a loving bride would obey her bridegroom out of love and passion. And because he loves me so much, how could I not do what he says? How could I take lightly what he's done for me? See, it's relationship. And we're all growing. We're in different places. What is permissible for you may not be permissible for me. That's why there's no line here. It's in your heart with God. It's where you're at. I don't know where you're at tonight, but I want to give you just a chance to take communion in a worthy manner if you feel like you're not worthy. Now, there's a difference between condemnation and conviction. The Holy Spirit's convicting your heart right now about some things in your life. Then you need to listen and ask him to forgive you. If you're under condemnation that you're not worthy anyway and that you're just an old rat, listen, that's, that's not God. He talks to us and he makes it clear what we've done. Listen, when I screw up, I know it. I know it. Or if I've picked up a habit that isn't pleasing to him and isn't profitable for my life in the kingdom, he will nag me about it until finally I say, oh, I'm miserable. I can't keep doing this. I hate myself. Have you ever said that? So as the team sings this song, once you guys get to your microphones and your instruments, and let's worship the Lord. I want to just give you an opportunity before we receive the bread and the blood just to talk to God as we're worshiping the Lord. You're right. I've only been in church not even an hour yet, so hang on. I'm grateful for that early church. I'm grateful that they were screw-ups. I'm grateful that God loved us so much that when we're screwing up, he fixes us. He nails us and says, stop it. Stop doing that. It's not right. You're better than that. You have a higher calling than that. You're worth more than that. My grace can help you change. Some of you, it may be something big. Some of you, it may just be a big mouth. You're just talking about people or you're negative about people and you're judging. God's just dealing with you about your tongue. Some of you have been fighting with your husband or your wife. Some of you just don't like people. Very judgmental. What if God says, you know what? I want to deal with that. This communion, I want to actually give you the grace to stop it, change it, to believe me. Some of you are afraid. Oh, listen to this one. Hmm. You're fearful. You're not in faith. You're not trusting. You're worried. The Holy Spirit's saying, stop. What are you doing? You can trust me if you can trust me with your eternity. You can trust me with your today and with your tomorrow. Some of you have messed up. Let him forgive you. You slipped up sexually with other things. Listen, let the blood cover it tonight before you take communion. Let him wash you. We're no different in the 21st century than they were in the first century. We're people, imperfect, getting to know this amazing, perfect God. But I don't want you to take it unworthily. I want you to get healed and cleansed. For this reason, many of you are sick and weak, weak in your faith. 
And many of you are sleeping or dying early. So let's fix it tonight. How do we fix it? You got to look at it, and then you have to ask God to forgive you and give it to him and trust him to cleanse, to help you not do it. You may slip up again and again, but sooner or later, you're going to stop. It's okay. So as we worship the Lord, let's just take a moment as we're singing just to talk to God about our own lives. Then as a family, we'll take communion. before we take communion, I just want to open the altar up. I don't know about you, but I want to kneel. Because I don't want this just to be a communion service. I actually really want to be changed. seated if you want. You don't have to stay. Have a conversation with the Holy Spirit for just a moment. We love you, Lord, as we partake of this meal. get back to our seats because now we need our ushers to pass out the communion cups. It's over. It's done. If we confess he's faithful and just. You know, I don't, I didn't recognize any sin in my life tonight. God wasn't convicting me of anything that I could pinpoint, but there is a hunger in me to be changed to know him like I've never known him. I don't know how to lead this church. Jim doesn't know how to lead this church. To hear God's voice this year, to love people, to believe more. Anybody there with me? We're family tonight. I'm just here, vulnerable before you, and you're vulnerable before me. But we're a community of family. This is my family. How can God take complete strangers from all races and ages and bring us together? And we become a family. We speak different languages. We have different paychecks. Some of you don't have any paychecks. You're so worried. Family. God loves you. As they pass this out, 
I want you to peel off and just take this wafer. Dan, I've asked to come and do communion with me. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We are proclaiming his death and remembering, and through the remembering, by faith, appropriating and receiving and partaking of the benefits that come from his identification with us so that we can identify with him. And here's this wafer. It represents his body. I think one of the most powerful things about this for me is that God identified with me and with you as a man. Here's God in the heavens who made everything, and yet here's his humanity made in his image, fallen prey to sin and disobedience, locked up in satanic power, unable to free ourselves from the law of sin and death, which said if you sin, you die. There was no strength in us to rescue ourselves. We can't keep ourselves alive. The star breather who made the galaxies stepped out of eternity and identified with us to the point of becoming one of us. One of us. He cried tears. He laughed. He understood rejection and hurt. He became our high priest and understood us. He said, a body you have prepared for me, sacrifice and burnt offering you do not want. Behold, I come to do your will in the volume of the book it is written of me. John looked at the throne of God in the revelation of Jesus Christ in Revelation 4 and he saw the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world take the scroll and unloose it for he has overcome heaven sings out he has redeemed us from every nation and every tribe and every kindred he is all man and all God and he said, this body is broken for you, Debbie Cobre. It's broken for you. I took the stripes. I paid the price. I became the lamb, the sacrifice, so that you won't be judged. And the penalty of the sins that you've done and that you will do are washed away. And you are justified and righteous and sanctified in my sight. And now I cannot just redeem you, child, but I can bring you back to the Father. And I can restore all that has been lost and reinstate you as a daughter of God, the body. He took the stripes. He paid the price. The Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. Father, thank you for the Lamb tonight. As we take this way for Lord, we remember and we are grateful and we thank you. And Jesus said, this is my body which is broken for you. Eat all of it in remembrance of me. His body, the bread, his blood, the wine, broken and poured out, all for love. The whole earth trembled, the veil was torn. Love so
He's the ransom from heaven. Jesus Messiah. He's the Lord of all. Tonight, as we examine the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, I just wanted to bring a couple of thoughts. Pastor Deborah had already mentioned about human blood and what it does. And she had quoted Leviticus chapter number 17, verse number 11. I believe we have it up on the overheads. And it says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. The word confirms what scientists now know and what they've seen is that without the blood, there's no life. Without it, you're, you're gonna be vulnerable, unprotected, there's going to be nothing flowing through you, no life, n no air, no oxygen. Your brain's not going to be able to function. If you don't have blood going to a certain part of your body, if, if the blood flow is cut off to that part of your body, then you've essentially cut off that member from your body. It's going to die and wither away. But look at what the rest of the verse says. He says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood... And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. You see, God is the one that gave us this life. God is the one that said, I have made a provision for sin. I'm the one who is initiating this. And so in the old covenant, we know that God put the blood of the sacrifice, the sacrificial lamb, upon the altar to make atonement. Now, what does atonement mean? Well, it means in the Old Testament, if you look at the word, it means a covering. That this was the covering for sin. Your sin was covered by the blood of that sacrifice that God had given us upon the altar. Every year, the high priest would make a sacrifice, first for himself and then for the nation. And he would carry that blood from the altar and burn up that animal upon the altar, and then he would take the blood into the most holy place, the holy of holies. There he would sprinkle that blood upon the top of the Ark of the Covenant, and upon the top of the Ark there was the mercy seat. And as he sprinkled that blood, it covered the sin of the nation of Israel for that year. And continually, the high priest, year after year, would have to go before the Lord and sprinkle that blood. Eventually that high priest would die and then another high priest would be selected and would come in and that high priest would have to do the same thing over and over and over again. And now Jesus comes in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 25. If we can put that up on the overhead as well. 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, verse 25. It says, in the same manner he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So now as we approach communion, no longer are we looking to something that's only going to cover sin for a year, and then as we mess up, it's going to have to be done again and again and again. No, now the atonement takes on a new meaning. If you look up the word atonement in the New Testament, it changes meaning. No longer is it just a covering for sin. Now it means that there's an exchange that's taken place. What is that exchange that's taken place? Well, now it's no longer the blood of an animal, no longer the blood of another. Now it's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that means that if the life of the flesh is in the blood, that now it's no longer your life. It's no longer the life of an animal. No, now it's the life of our Lord Jesus Christ that was poured out on the cross for you and I. And he gave his life so that we could have that life. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar. The altar that Jesus Christ went to was that cross. To make atonement, no longer just a covering, but now to give an exchange. What exchange was it? Well, our filthy lives for his perfect, spotless, sinless life. What exchange was it? Our poverty for his riches. What exchange was it? Our sickness and our weakness for his health and for his strength. Our life for his life. A, a guilty life. Lord, as, as I give it to you, now he says, my innocent life makes atonement. There's an exchange that takes place. The Bible says that now we are robed with his righteousness. That's why the Bible tells us to put on Christ. 
And he says, as we approach this communion table, that we are to do this in remembrance of him. As you drink this, realize that you're approaching now in a worthy manner. If you've received Jesus Christ into your heart and life, you are worthy to come and partake of this communion. If you've repented of sin tonight, realize that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Yeah, you may feel bad, and that's okay. Feel bad about it, because that means you won't do it again. But realize that there's no condemnation. You can drink of this cup. And as you do, it represents the life of the Lord Jesus Christ going on the inside of you and becoming a part of you. Now that God kind of life, you can live by faith in the Son of God who loved you and gave himself for you. Now drink your health, drink your strength, drink your prosperity, drink your wisdom, drink what you need in your life. Why? Because it is sealed in a new covenant. There is a new agreement sealed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ for you and for me. Let's pray together. Father God, tonight, we love you. And Lord, we're so grateful that you have given us your life, that you've given us your blood, Lord. And so tonight, as we come and partake of this cup, God, we receive the life of God on the inside of us by faith, Lord. Symbolic in this cup, Lord. We thank you, Father, for healing. We thank you for provision. We thank you for blessing. We thank you for wisdom, God. We thank you for strength, God. We thank you for that Zoe, God kind of life going on the inside of us. Lord, as we partake, we remember you. Now go ahead and peel back that tin foil and let's receive together. Why don't you stand with me? Let's sing this as we're dismissed tonight. Me whole again. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So precious is the Lord that makes me white as snow. Yeah.